We are proud to announce the 2019 Palisade Global Hard Asset Conference, taking place on Jackal Island from May 16th to May 20th. Speakers confirmed include one of the most successful venture capital fund managers within the resource space, Marin Katusa. Legendary mining investor Paul Matizek, former hedge fund manager Mike Alkin, and CEO at US Global Investors, Frank Holmes. All these guests, plus many more to be announced. Sign up now for more details and to be included in our special guest list. Join us in Jackal Island. Become part of a growing number of investors who are ready to take advantage of the coming resource boom. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your guest host, Karema Mutlu, and on today's show, we have CEO and Chairman of Cobalt 27, Anthony Molesky. How are you today, Anthony? Hey, I'm great. Thanks again uh, for having me back. Looking forward to uh, being on the show in 2019. Let's talk about the adoption rate of electric vehicles and where we stand at the beginning of 2019. Do you think 2019 will mark the beginning of a tipping point for electric vehicles? And will China continue to be the main consumer of electric vehicle adoption? And how important is China for the EV industry? Yeah, so I would actually argue that, that 2018 was the tipping point and, and 2019 will really be an acceleration of it. You know, the the adoption rates are off the chart. When I think about, you know, a year and a half ago where um, analysts projected 2025 uh, adoption and I look at where we're at today, I'm, I'm to be honest, even personally startled by how quickly it's happening. So, you know, if we look at the tail end of last year, you know, you had a month where 10% of new car sales in in uh, in California were electric. You know, you had a, a similar statistic in Canada, and and you know, definitely some of that was just driven by the excitement around the Model Three from Tesla. But I think it's also showing uh, this this uh, you know latent demand in in consumers for an electric vehicle that in a lot of ways, is more technologically advanced than what they're driving now, and and, um, and people are prepared to go out and buy them. And that's just in, in the U.S. and Canada. You know, if you look into Europe, in Norway, and, and some of these countries, um, the sales are astronomical. And, and that's not even really the story. The story, as you kind of highlighted with your question, is China, where, you know, in addition to – you know, in addition to the Chinese government uh, wanting to clean up the environment in China and China really taking what I would consider to be a leadership role globally in environmental policy around electric vehicles, you know, you also see uh, a government mandate to to build an industry, and that industry is the electric vehicle industry. And I think that you know China wants to sell you not just a battery not just an electric vehicle, but an electric vehicle with a battery that's made in China. And so, you know, you, you see the engine uh, really firing up, as it were, in, in China and the adoption accelerating and, and a, a, a government-led mandate around um, adoption of the technology and development of it. So it's it's an exciting time and it's the hockey stick and it's really taken off, you know, in 2018 and we're going to see that trend continue in 2019. Let's move on to the cobalt market. 2018 was a year of softening prices and general consolidation within the cobalt space. Do the fundamentals still suggest that there is not enough supply for cobalt going forward? So in 2018, you know, what you really saw was an artisanal response in the Congo. And, and I think that what's really going to be interesting in 2019 is to see whether or not Ultimately, automobile makers and battery makers care about supply chain security, and you know that's going to be driven by consumers. And so, I think as we move forward, and consumers really voice their concerns around, um, you know, ethically sourced cobalt, it puts pressure on battery makers to actually not just rely on a piece of paper, but go there and watch the supply chain. So, so what we saw was a, a pretty material response in the Congo from the artisanal. Um, the artisanal uh, miners, and that put a lot of pressure on the intermediates market, which is different than the metal market. Uh, you know what we kind of see is that around twenty nine to thirty one dollars in that range is where um, it makes sense incrementally for the artisanal miners to mine. And so when I think about twenty nineteen, 
you know, what I see is a very strong metal market with robust demand growth from, you know, jet engine makers and, and, and you know, these types of consumers. So I think that that's a robust um, demand there, uh, especially where, you know, they want long-standing relationships with metal brands and, and those things can take years to actually develop so i don't see that they would be switching to chinese metal especially in the face of you know some of the problems or alleged problems with with metal brands having you know out of china having potentially used artisanal mining so i think that the, the metal industry is robust whereas with the intermediates uh, which is really where the weakness is today you know i think what you're going to have is you know the first half of the year the market will need to get through that intermediate production. You know, then you can see the price uh, move that back up towards, um, you know, the thirty dollar range where, uh, twenty nine thirty dollar range where the artisanals sit, and then when you really see that next push uh, in the cobalt price, is when you know the adoption ramps up. You know, probably you know probably in twenty twenty. So, I think that you're going to see um, you know uh, the whole thing play out through twenty nineteen. Very good. Copper is another market that has failed to meet investors' expectations of higher prices throughout 2018. How much of a role does a stronger dollar and higher US interest rates play on the current sentiment for copper? What are your current thoughts? Look, Dr. Copper, as it were, you know, I, I, uh, I think that you will see all-time highs for copper through this next cycle. Um, I, I just think it's hard to time, you know, time that i mean you know personally i've i've bought a number of kind of out of the money junior uh copper stocks just because they're options and, and at some moment the copper market will go you know when when you look at the tremendous you know demand that's going to be put on copper in the form of electrification of the power grid and and and, and all the changes that are underway, and we're only talking a lot electric vehicles right now, but actually the bigger story is going to, of course, be battery uh, and grid storage um, for renewables. But when you talk about that, that, that demand, uh, and then you look at the pipeline for copper projects, you know, it, it's only a question of when and not if. And, and, you know, is that 2019? Is it 2020? You know, it's hard to call. But I do think that the longer uh, the market doesn't allow for capital to come in for new projects and for projects to be built and for exploration, the bigger the move is going to be when it happens. You know, certainly if you monitor analysts and, and journalists and, and, you know, other commentators and, and really if you just look at where the big mining companies are spending their money, you know, it's on copper and then, you know, to a lesser extent on nickel. So uh, I really believe that copper is going to have – a tremendous, uh, a tremendous run here, but very hard to call when that's going to be with the macro overlay of a trade war and, and as you indicated, a strong U.S. dollar, and and probably a tough earnings season we saw from Apple that um, you know the trade war is having an impact on on some of these companies. So, you know, it's hard to pinpoint that it's going to happen in the next month or two, but you certainly can feel the pressure building on the system, and when it goes, I think it's going to be a tremendous. Uh, a tremendous uh, metal to own, probably through equities. Let's talk about some of the possible risks that might be associated with the EV story. Is there anything that worries you over the next few years that might stall the adoption and in turn stall the increased demand for battery materials? One issue that comes to mind includes the amount of subsidies that are currently included when you purchase an electric vehicle in certain countries. What happens when or if these subsidies are taken away? Is that a risk? Yeah, look, I think a lot of those subsidies have already rolled off and are starting to roll off. <clears throat> and what you've seen is price compression on the car. So, you know, you saw Tesla reduce the cost of the car, I think in part to make up for that. Uh, you see battery costs going down. So, you know, those subsidies, I think, were extremely helpful in in really kicking off the industry and, and really advancing it. But it's only it's only natural that you would see uh, subsidies reduced, uh, and and as the price of the car kind of comes into equilibrium with uh, similarly uh, situated models, I think that um, I don't think that there will be an impact. And frankly, as a complete aside, look at the oil and gas industry and all the subsidies they have still. So uh, I don't think that the subsidies will completely go away. I do think it's natural that. Um, 
that some of them will roll off and we're seeing them roll off and it's not Im- impacting demand. So uh, I think the bigger the bigger kind of risk is just a macro risk. You know, people don't buy new cars when uh, there's a recession. Right? Like I think that's whether that's electric or gas. And so I, I think, you know, the bigger um, question mark for me isn't if people are going to buy EVs. It's going to be, you know, if there's a big global recession, does that slow down? the pace at which people just are buying new cars and hence adopting electric vehicles. So for me, it's more of a timing issue. I think these macro factors could all, always delay timing. Uh, we're not seeing that at the moment, uh, but I think that would be one of the big risk factors just sort of sitting out there. As we wrap up this interview, Anthony, is there anything else you'd like to discuss today? Anything on your mind? Yeah, look, I think I think the two things uh, I would say, um, I think nickel is is uh, going to be really interesting. Uh, once again, you know, timing it is tricky. You know, <laughs> you sort of wonder, I mean, you could go buy nickel on the LME for cheaper than it costs to add in, in, in incremental nickel mines. So I think nickel is, is interesting. And then I think the story that people really haven't gotten their heads around, and, and it's going to be, in terms of its overall size, far larger than the electric vehicle story, is simply – you know, battery storage, grid storage, as it pertains to renewables, as it pertains to just your home. And that story will incorporate, by the way, not just lithium, nickel, and cobalt, but but likely things like vanadium and zinc as different technologies will be used for different applications. And, you know, there'll be multiple market segments. And, and that story will roll out and, and start to roll out um, into the equity markets, I think, in 2019 and have a tremendous impact on the psyche of, of investors as people start to fully appreciate the size and scale of that uh, complete transformation of the energy industry uh, in the same way that, that we're seeing with the electric vehicle. And so that's going to be a theme that emerges in 2019 that people aren't really focused on yet. Excellent. And as a final point, Anthony, let's get your views on the lithium market and the news that was released from Cobalt 27 a few days ago. Yeah, so you know we uh, acquired a royalty on Mount Marion Mine in Australia. You know one of one of the one of the great mines there in Australia, uh, long life, multi decades left. For us, that was really a decision around you know bringing near term cash flow into the business. But lithium, much like nickel and cobalt, uh, has a tremendous uh, a tremendous um, demand spike as the electric vehicles adopted, and so. You know, once again, there's probably a little bit more at play there in the lithium market than in, say, the cobalt market, which is a byproduct, or the nickel market, which has tremendous capex to build new mines. But notwithstanding all those points, I think it's pretty clear that um, the lithium-ion battery is the, you know, the clear winner for the next decade uh, to power the electric vehicles. So, you know, we're, we're bullish on the demand profile of, of lithium going forward and think that um, that royalty is important for Cobalt 27 just in terms of bringing more near-term cash flowing assets into the company. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Anthony, and we'll have you back on the show again very soon. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?